Hello and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chris Kamdaya. Thank you so much for joining us as we look at how communities can best support Ukrainian refugees. Now, you might remember that on the 1st of March, uh, Priti Patel, the Home Secretary, promised an uncapped humanitarian sponsorship scheme. And uh, we at Sanctuary Foundation thought that was a brilliant idea and encouraged lots of people to sign up for a program that didn't yet exist. And 11,000 people signed up pretty quickly. And then by the grace of God, the government opened its humanitarian sponsorship route uh, called the Homes for Ukraine project. And over 200,000 people around the country have offered support and hospitality to Ukrainian refugees. Now, not all of those uh, 200,000 that have registered so far have um, offered to house refugees in their home. So there's many of us who can't do that for various reasons. Uh, we can't, we haven't got the space, we might be foster parents, that might be complicated with the children that we're looking after, all sorts of reasons we can't host in our own homes, but we still want to do something. Uh, and that's where uh, the community playing its role in surrounding and supporting refugees uh, becomes really, really important. And that's what our seminar today is going to be looking at. Now, I know, uh, having spoken to many of you, uh, that some of you are really frustrated that your refugees aren't here yet. You've registered, you've filled in the visa application forms, and it is frustrating. And we're with you that that's really tough. Uh, but we can't answer that question today. That's up to the Home Office. If you've got specific feedback you'd like to give to the Home Office that we can try and make the system better, contact us at hello at sanctuaryfoundation.org.uk. But today we're thinking about how we positively wrap around uh, families and new arrivals from Ukraine. And um, I want to talk about why, why we want to activate and mobilise communities. And then we're going to talk about the how. And we've got lots of amazing guests uh, to speak to you, uh, some people who are Ukrainian, who've had lots of experience of welcoming Ukrainians, uh, some people who have expertise in safeguarding, people that have expertise in education and working with children. We're going to have a whole range of different uh, guests, and we are going to take your questions as we go through. Uh, but let me start uh, with a, a bunch of the slides that we've put together. My wife put them together for me, actually, so she gets all credit. And uh, I want to start by talking about why. Why are we trying to coordinate community support for Ukrainian refugees? And the groups, uh, next slide, please, the groups that would come together to support are going to be all sorts of people. So you might be your local school. Schools are fantastic hubs to support people coming here uh, from Ukraine because most people are coming with children. Universities, businesses, business partnerships, sports teams. Uh, we've seen that with Afghanistan. It was amazing to be able to welcome uh, Afghan football teams, often women footballers and football teams are kind of wrapped around people. Churches and faith communities have an incredible track record of welcoming refugees, particularly from Syria in the community sponsorship program. Uh, book clubs, pubs, neighbourhood groups, villages, churches, charities, youth centres and festivals all are playing their part. And it's absolutely amazing. And we all have different skills and gifts that we can bring. Um, now, what are the advantages of community models uh, of support? We need the next slide, please. Uh, I think the first thing we want to say is greater capacity. My wife and I are foster parents, and it's it's great. We love being foster parents, but we do it better when we're in a team. So we're part of a group called our Mockingbird Group, run by a lovely couple in our community. And it gets all the foster carers together to support each other, and it gives us greater endurance. We can get someone to complain about things with, someone to be inspired by with, someone to pick ideas and, 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 our, and our brains of. And so if we work together, we're going to have greater capacity. It also is going to offer better safety for hosts. Again, on your own, you might inadvertently make a mistake, might do things that are not appropriate. Well, in a team, people will be able to watch your back and make sure that you get the support that you need. Um, it also makes it all a bit, bit more public. We also think it's going to help with better integration, helping people integrate into the community as a community. Working together is going to help people feel more, not just a part of our household, but a part of the communities that we live in. It might help us support larger family groups. Uh, some of us have space in our house for maybe one or two adults and maybe a child. Um, but it might be a bigger family group needs to come and be split up over various households. And if we're working those households together, we're going to be able to give better support to larger families. Because refugees that arrive through the uh, Home for Ukraine scheme 
do have access to public funds, what that means is pretty soon we can start looking for housing for them. And again, if you've got some other people that can help you with that as part of a team, we'll be able to integrate them into housing more quickly. The other thing is, I don't know if you've been noticing, but the government is listening on this subject of how to help refugees. And if we do that as a team, we can report back what's happening, where the problems are and how we can make life better. So we think we can make a more transformative impact if we work together. So instead of thinking of the basic unit of um, refugee welcome being one household, um, welcoming one uh, refugee community, one, one refugee family, if instead of thinking about it that way, we think about a whole village, town, sports club, book group, working together, I think we'll hit all of those different areas and we'll be more sustainable, more impactful, safer and altogether better. Now, next slide, please. The, the, the other thing we need to think about are some of the different areas that refugees are going to need help with. And again, when you think about it, it's quite a lot of different things. And knowing that there's other people that are helping you with that is going to, again, help you have greater impact. And we'll be talking through some of the models that have been used over the years uh, to help refugees integrate. But just so that you know, some of the things that we need to think about. Uh, the local authority, they have some responsibilities of caring for refugees. Uh, the government has set some statutory responsibilities on them. And so knowing how to integrate and liaise and connect with the local authority is going to be important. We've got someone today from the local government association helping us with that. Education, absolutely vital in order for a refugee family to feel at home, knowing that your kids are being looked after and educated is a game changer for their integration. So who's going to help with that? Employment. Many of the refugees would like to work as soon as it's possible. They want to pay their way in the world. And again, how do we help them line up jobs? Housing, as we said, they have recourse to public funds. They will be able to rent a house through social housing as soon as that's possible. For many people, the sooner the better. It's going to give them a sense of self and a sense of autonomy. Health, how do people access the healthcare needs uh, that they might have? How do they get registered with a GP or a dentist or maybe mental health support? We're going to need help helping people there. English language, some of our Ukrainian friends speak amazing English. Some are going to need a little bit of help getting access. How do we get them access uh, to the training that they need? What about benefits? How do we help them access the benefits they need? And finally, safeguarding. How do we keep people safe? You can see that's a long list of things. And it's going to be helpful if we can divvy up some of those responsibilities amongst the community, maybe amongst those that can't host but could help in other ways. OK, next slide. So I've just got three different models that have been used over the years. And as you think about your community, one of these models might better fit you than others. So the first model is called the community hub model. And that's good for a town or a village or a neighbourhood or a church where people are organising maybe their own matching. This will involve networking hosts together in a locality who might have matched independently. So maybe they've gone on Reset's website or they've matched on Facebook or Instagram. But helping those hosts to get together regularly could be really helpful. We've already started doing that in the town that I live even ahead of people actually arriving. Getting to know the hosts around you could be a great idea. I know many of you have tried that already. Uh, you might want to develop a database of volunteers and those offering support. Someone might be offering some English language tuition. Someone might be offered to run some errands. Someone might be offering to uh, you know, start that housing application form. Let's get a database together of people that can help. Uh, you might want to offer a kind of welcome care package. Imagine you could get those ready. Local businesses might want to get involved so that every refugee family that arrives gets a bundle of stuff. I know welcome churches run something called welcome boxes that could be useful for that. Uh, you might want to do a welcome event. We've already started doing that in my town. Uh, we did a little walk. We did a big reception. Again, as people begin to arrive, there are ways that our towns and communities can step up to welcome people. Um, you might want to organize some ongoing networking events so that people from Ukraine can meet each other. They might not know the other refugees that are in their area. You can help that to happen. Second model is the community volunteer model. And that's going to need another slide, please, Callum. And uh, that model is maybe good for a school or a church where no matches have been made yet. And uh, that could involve people already kind of doing some due diligence even before people arrive. You know, where might they be able to find accommodation? Uh, where could we do a meet and greet? And, you know, where are people going to be arriving? How can we meet and greet them into our community? How can we be thinking through community integration? Uh, what are the ongoing 
uh, networks of support that might be uh, available. Now, this community volunteer model uh, has been used in the past when one refugee family moves into a community, a whole bunch of people wrap around them. That's why we've got the family with the hands around them. And so maybe there's one family that you know that's arriving into your community, your village, your neighbourhood, and you might organise to be a team of support around that one family, as opposed to the community um, hub model where you're networking lots and lots of hosts together this is the community wrapping around one family that's another model that people have used uh, in the past final model and uh, then we're going to introduce you to our first guest uh, is the community interest model and that could be where people are getting together and they've got a common interest. That could be a church, a football club, a choir. And you're saying, OK, we have an interest in this. Could we make a connection with another interest group uh, in Ukraine, in Poland that might want to support refugees um, or might be a group of refugees? So imagine you're connecting with a group of politicians or lawyers or footballers or artists in Ukraine or in um, um, Poland or Romania. And you're saying our little choir can connect with this choir that's over there. Our little football team can connect with this football team over here. And that's going to be the bridge that you've already got a common community interest here that you're inviting other people into. You can have a think about which model is going to work for you. I guess the one that we're working with most commonly is what we're calling the community hub model. where We're networking uh, those different um, hosts together to see if we can provide that kind of support. That's probably the one that we're going to talk about most today, but those other models do exist too. Great. Well, thank you. I hope that's uh, helped you understand some of the different ways that we can work. Yes, these slides are available uh, for you afterwards if you'd like them to be, but I'd love to introduce you uh, to a, a new friend of mine I've made called Sophia. And uh, Sophia is part of the Ukrainian community in Bradford. And uh, Sophia, um, just tell us a little bit about the history of Ukrainians coming to the UK. Hi, good afternoon. My name's Sophia and like Rish says, we're in Bradford and thousands of refugees, including my own grandparents, came over after the World War II, so about 1947, from displaced people's camps in Germany. Um, so I trekked all the way across Europe and then ended up in Germany and then finally settled in the UK. Um, my grandparents came to Bradford. Uh, a lot did for the work, um, worked in the mills. We had a thriving mill industry in Bradford. Um, all worked extremely hard and self-funded a community centre. And then we outgrew that one, purchased a second one, which we still currently reside in over 70 years later. Um, we integrated into communities, worked very hard, and we were helped and supported massively by neighbours and colleagues, um, English colleagues, um, and just all dug in and became in, embedded in the community. That's amazing. It gives us great confidence that it can be successful, that people from Ukraine can move to the UK. The UK has got a history of welcoming people from Ukraine, and people can really build family build a life here and really thrive. You told me something interesting I hadn't thought of before, Sophia, that you said that, that it's only your daughter, who's a fourth generation, I think, Ukrainian, um, feels like a Brit. You felt primarily as a Ukrainian in Britain. Can you tell us a little bit about that? We do. And I think it's only maybe in the recent weeks when we've been discussing Ukraine obviously, so much with our friends and um, our British friends that it's, it's a little bit hard for people to understand that we were born in British we've got in we're born British we've got British passports but yet we still associate ourselves with being Ukrainian we've been brought up with the culture the heritage the traditions um, extremely proud of what our grandparents went through to get to get over here to get us a better life um, my daughter my husband's English and my daughter is the first English blood <laughs> if you want to call it um, <laughs> So we, call, we class ourselves as Ukrainian and we always will be my sister. I remember telling you my sister went to school and couldn't speak English when she went to primary school a few no, years no. ago. Um, so we do class ourselves as Ukrainian. So with the current war, we do feel like it's affecting us personally, our friends and family that are out there. Um, so, yeah, we do feel more Ukrainian than British. <laughs> Thank you. Well, look. The Ukrainian community has obviously done an amazing job of settling in and making an impact in, in British culture, you know, helping our nation to thrive. 
what do you think our friends who are wanting to organize community groups for this new bunch of arrivals can be learning from the previous integration of Ukrainians? I think it's very, it's a very different time. Um, over the years, we've welcomed Ukrainians within a sense of economic migration. But even if as a community, we are shocked and beyond belief that we are welcoming families as refugees. I never thought, even though there's been a conflict in Ukraine, in eastern Ukraine for over eight years, I don't think anyone dared to believe that this would even happen. And so it's it's brand new to us. We're learning mm. lessons. We're trying to establish ways to help people when they get over here. So when my grandparents come, it was very different. It was a different, very different time. So I think we're learning. So if anyone wants to take anything from this, that we are Ukrainian, we've got, we can speak the language, we know the culture, we know the heritage, traditions, but it, we're still learning how to how to help refugees when they finally get over here. That's really helpful. We have a little phrase that we use in, in our organisation, nothing about us without us. And so rather than working for Ukrainians or doing things to Ukrainians, we'd like to do things with Ukrainians and, and make sure that we're being appropriate and, and honouring people's cultures. Uh, and so one way we could do that maybe is, is to reach out to existing Ukrainian community groups. How, how can people do that? How can people find out if there's one near them? Yeah, we're part of the Association of Ukrainians in Great Britain, the AUGB. Um, it's long-standing. Um, it's the largest representative body of Ukrainians and descent and their descendants. There's 28 local branches with some kind of community centre, social centre, and then a further 19 smaller branches that just might be a hub or a community. And there's probably even more with the current migration of the recent years of Ukrainians coming over, especially down in London. Um, there's a lot of Ukrainians in London. So we do have a website, which is um, augb.co.uk. And, and there is a whole list of branches within that website. Um, and then also each branch is likely to have a Facebook page. Bradford, we, we have a Facebook page and that's got every update of what we're doing, currently doing, every um, incentive that we're working on is, is on there. So I'm sure if you just search for your local area, um, Ukrainians are everywhere. You all, Everyone always knows a <laughs> Ukrainian. Um, even great. just that one person in your village, you still might know somebody. Amazing. I'm really keen that we work in partnership wherever we can. And I know Ukrainians that have been here for a long time have got loads of skills and know they'll be able to advise people on language and culture and all that sort of stuff. But we recognise there's a lot of people coming. And so knowing there's a whole bunch of people that are backing you up and helping you support Ukrainians, hopefully this will be a, a lovely partnership. So, Sophia, yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, stick around if you can. We, we might have questions for you later as, as we do Q&A. But it's a pleasure. And, uh, yeah, God bless you and the work that you're doing. Thank you. Great. Well, um, as you saw, um, relationships with the local authority are going to be quite important if you're trying to organise local support. And, and so it's excellent that we have uh, Sally Burlington, who works for the Local Government Association, uh, helping us understand what it is that local authorities are going to be doing and how we can work effectively uh, with them. Sally, tell us a little bit about your role, first of all, and um, help us understand then what, what local groups need to understand about what local authorities are already doing. Thanks very much, Krish, and thanks for inviting me to be part of this. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and really, uh, it's it's really inspiring just looking at all the connections and, and the contacts that are being made in the chat and the passion that people are bringing to this. Um, my role is in the Local Government Association, as you said, which represents councils in England, and also we work with the Welsh LGA in Wales. I know there's uh, people from Wales in the chat as well. Um, and I've been spending a lot of my time recently, along with you and many others, working with government officials as the uh, Homes for Ukraine scheme gets off the ground. And we're working through lots and lots of issues, um, some of which are being reflected in the chat. I thought it might be most helpful if I if I set out what we know currently about what council's job is in this space. And I'll try and address some of the points that are um, being raised in the chat as I go through. And then I'll just briefly talk about some of the things that still need to be resolved as we look forward and try and work. Yeah, together thanks. To 
move on. So um, there is guidance uh, for councils, um, which if you're interested, you can find on the Department for Leveling Up's website. It's on the same page as the guidance for sponsors and the FAQs, all of which are pretty helpful um, information for people. Um, that guidance has set out some of the key aspects of the scheme, which are now fixed. So um, as people will know, the application for a visa has to be done jointly between the sponsor and the person arriving. When that visa application is approved by the Home Office, the data about the sponsor and the address that people are coming to is then given to the council. So it's not until that point of approval that the data will flow to the council. And at that point, obviously, the person is free to come to the UK and uh, the council has to undertake two types of checks. So there's um, a check required on the accommodation and the FAQs, if you haven't seen them, um, do set out quite a lot of the detail about what's required to ensure that the accommodation is safe and appropriate and there's access to the right kind of facilities and so on. Um, we are asking for a bit more clarity over exactly what's expected because there's obviously been quite a lot of debate about exactly where you set those standards and that hasn't been set out by government but obviously the main imperative is to get people as quickly um, here as we can so we're keen to be pragmatic there and the second, second set of checks is around um, safeguarding where people will know there's a requirement for a, a DBS check for all adults in the sponsor's household. And if there are children under 18 or vulnerable adults coming, uh, there will have to be an enhanced DBS check. And the council will be responsible for those um, checks and will pay the cost of those DBS checks as well. Then once the property checks are complete, um, the and, and that's not a barrier to people arriving. We know that some people are arriving before the checks have been complete mm -hmm. and councils are just trying to move as quickly as they can um, to do both sets of checks um, in a pragmatic way. But once the property check is complete, then the council can pay the sponsor the £350 per month. And the guidance says that that has to be in arrears rather than in advance. And councils will also make the £200 payments to the person arriving to help with their initial expenses. And then there's, of course, the much wider set of discussions, which you're talking about here, about how we support integration, help people to get benefits where they need it or employment, how they get into school places, um, get access to English language support if they need it and so on. And it's brilliant that you're having this um, event today because this is the way we can really understand what the needs are there. Um, one point of clarification that people might need to be aware of, the in in county areas, there are two tiers of councils and your district council will be responsible for the accommodation check, but the county council will be responsible for the safeguarding check. Um, in, in big cities, it's the same council responsible for both, but just for, in case there's a bit of confusion there. Um, and then, of course, there's still quite a lot to be resolved and decided um, and we'll need to help uh, councils and local voluntary and community groups work together to kind of make yeah. sure we're getting all this right. And we're still asking for some clarification on key issues around exactly what's yeah. expected in the safeguarding space and how we get access to NHS care and, and various other things. And we're also raising questions about when it, whether people um, who've come through the family visa route can have access to the sponsorship scheme, because yeah. that's not the case at the moment. But I'll stop there um, and very happy to take questions, of course. No, thanks, Sally. Um, a really helpful overview. And thanks for picking up lots of the questions that have come up in the chat. And, and I've been in lots of meetings with you. And, and sometimes there can be friction between what central government won and what local authorities can deliver. But you're a great peacemaker of, of finding a, a way to find a solution. And, and that's where we're at here. You know, there are lots of things that we're frustrated about. The system isn't working the way that we want. But how can we make this a success? Um, you know, the, the nation wants to respond. Local authorities want to respond. Central government wants to respond. We're all just figuring out how we do this. And we're doing it at pace, aren't we? And it's complicated. But thank you for, for all that you've brought. Just just a quick question. As, as these groups, let's say a group forms in, in your town or in your kind of local neighbourhood, um, is, is, are there obvious kind of liaison points with the local authority? Like who, who are the people? Local authority websites can be complicated to narrow, uh, navigate sometimes. Is, is there an obvious place that people should begin that conversation with their local authority? 
Well, it looks a bit different everywhere because the the kind of shape of community groups and the voluntary sector and the, the way in which communities work with their councils varies by area. Um, all councils will have a relationship with their local voluntary sector organisations and many of them have um, a kind of ongoing relationship with the umbrella body for the voluntary sector, which there are several, but you, you might know v, um, NCVO and others that kind of operate to support VCS organisations in the locality. So um, if it's not obvious on your council website um, how to um, kind of work with your communities to support this scheme, I would suggest that people work with the local VCS who will be thinking about this and clearly are, and we're seeing a lot yeah. of that in the chat already. Um, but it'll be easiest for your council to engage with umbrella groups that are organising across communities if that's not yes. already set up. That's right. And, and it's lovely seeing those connections already being made, people that have got groups going, groups coming together. I think rather than being lots of groups in one city or one town, it's better if we can be an umbrella to give a single point of contact where possible. Sally, stick around. I'm, I'm sure we'll have uh, lots more questions to raise uh, with you. But thank, thanks for what you're doing and thanks for joining us today. Um, right, we're going to hear from a few more people before we open it up for some questions. We're going to hear a little bit more about DBS checks. I know people have got questions about that. Uh, but because a lot of the people arriving are mothers with small children um, at Sanctuary, we've, we've really made it a priority to make sure that mothers and children are safe. Uh, and this comes out of our experience working with Afghan refugees. And, and a, a key partner uh, is the amazing Baby Basics. And it's great. We've got Kat, who's the CEO of Baby Basics, joining us from a warehouse in Sheffield. Um, there you are. Are you outside? I am outside, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Um, Kat, help us understand. Look, lots of people want to support mums and children. What are some of the priorities as people are beginning to get those different groups of organising together? What what are things that, that community groups can be doing to prepare for mums and children to arrive safely into our communities? So I think some of the most important to things to remember and think about is that these um, mums and young children have been through a huge amount and have travelled incredible distances to get to your community or to your home. And um, we are very passionate at Baby Basics that if you are, can look after the mother by ensuring that the children have got what they need, it takes away some of that stress and anxiety for the mums. So what we really want to ensure is that every child, especially we specialise in naught to five year olds, um, has a safe space to sleep. So that's important to make sure that it is age appropriate. So whether that's be a Moses basket for a naught to four month old or a cot or a toddler bed or a single bed with a bed guard so that they've got a safe, warm place to sleep. And what's most important in that is that it's fine to use a secondhand cot as long as you've kind of safety checked it. But any bed, any cot, um, any Moses basket must have a brand new mattress to meet safer sleep guidelines. Um, so cots and, and sleeping spaces are really important. Clothing, toys, toiletries, um, ensuring that these kids are warm, they're entertained, they're clean, they've got access to nappies, all of those kind of things are really important. Practical things like thinking about feeding equipment. So are you going to need high chairs? Are you going to need toddler cups and plates and spoons and all of those kind of things? Um, so it's just thinking out of the box. And on Sanctuary Foundation website, we've got some checklists. Um, that, that are done by age um, about the type of things that you're going to need um, and also on there we have available a referral form so if there's anything that you aren't able to supply or you're unsure of supplying um, you can access it from us and the final thing to really think about is travel um, so that's both in terms of how are you going to pick up these families from the airport and most importantly is car seats um, and that's what we are desperate for at the moment and we're working really hard to try and get a connection with somebody who can give us lots of car seats um, but it's really important that you use new car seats like it's really easy to be able to pick them up on Facebook Marketplace secondhand but if you use a secondhand car seat it can nullify your car insurance because you cannot prove that a car seat has not been in a crash um, and is therefore safe so new car seats is really important but also things like push chairs um, buggy boards um, pram so that these mums can feel that they can access their community their new community independently is really important thank you Kat that's really helpful I mean some people go hang on you know a new car seat these people aren't going to be able to drive why can't we just go and stick an old one in our car surely that doesn't really matter 
Um, what, what would you say back to that? What I would say back to that is that, yes, these families themselves are not going to have cars straight away, but they may have cars in the future. Um, and we hope once they get into employment and they can become more self-sufficient, that that's something that they will aspire to have. But also, if you're really wanting to welcome and bring that Ukrainian family into part of your community or part of your family, then you might need to take them out in your car. Um, and therefore, you're still going to need a car seat. Um, so it's, it's really important. And new is really important um, because, like I say, it can nullify your car insurance if you use a secondhand yeah. car seat that you can't prove um, is safe. Um, so that's that's really important. Thank you, Kat. And, and as you said, on the um, Sanctuary website, there is a list of things that you need to be thinking about. Uh, we also did an amazing uh, Mother's Day appeal. That appeal is still mm. open. I think there's been 10,000 items, over 50,000 pounds worth of uh, new material has been donated. Uh, we're not doing collections. It's all been through an Amazon wish list. But you could be, again, talking with uh, your hosts, asking them what they're missing. And if the community can't supply that need, then Baby Basics are taking referrals, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, and people can find the details of that, I guess, on the Sanctuary website as well, can't they? Yeah, it's all on the Sanctuary Foundation website. What we ask is that you don't put a referral into us until the visas have been granted, because obviously we want to prioritise getting um, stuff out to people in order of their arrival. But the idea is, is that as soon as visa has been granted and we know what you need, we will get everything delivered to families um, before the Ukrainian families arrive. But as a community, what would be really, really helpful to us is if you've got if you've got um, five or six different hosts in your community who are all welcoming families with children under five years old that need equipment that you do it as a mass referral so that we can deliver yeah. to one community space um, because that cuts down our costs it makes it easier for you guys um, and and we can ensure that, that you've got what you need brilliant well thank you for the work that you do and we know you care about ukrainians that's obvious you've also been working with afghans and you continue yeah. to support vulnerable mothers up and down the uk and i've been doing so at, at you know great great personal cost so thanks for what you're doing keep up the great work Pleasure. thank you for having me excellent well we're seeing some lovely uh, comments in the chat people wanting to get together i wish sanctuary could offer you a global database we're not able to do that right now of who's doing what what we've done in our area is a few of us got together and then we went through the different facebook groups the community facebook groups just saying look anyone interested in helping ukrainians uh, why don't we come together we, we used a church hall uh, that make, made themselves available to us and just invited everybody to come in and uh, then we found out where different people were at that event people began to realize okay some of us live in the town some of us live in some of the villages surrounding the villages got together so if if there isn't an established group in your area you might be the person that could be the coordinator and uh, soon uh, if you register on the sanctuaryfoundation.org.uk website uh, we'll have a little playbook for you of what you could be doing in your community to get going and some of those roles some some groups are really advanced you've been doing this for a long time some are just getting started uh, but it's been wonderful to see uh, that happening across the uk now i, I want to speak with someone who's been doing this for a while actually um and susanna is going to join me and um Susanna's been working with uh, Syrian refugees and the Pickwell Foundation was set up to kind of help welcome refugees into North Devon. And uh, so let, let's hear a little bit about what you've been doing, Susanna, already. And then maybe some of your top tips uh, for new groups that are getting started. Hmm. Thank you, Chris, and it's lovely to be here. Um, so, yeah, we've been working for the last um, five years with the Community Sponsorship Scheme, and as a result, we've got a really good relationship with our local council and feel like we ought to just offer something here as soon as we heard the Homes for Ukraine scheme um, was announced. So, um, so we're probably working, listening to your models, Chris, we're probably working closely to, with the community volunteer um, model, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that and offer five tips or examples of things that you can do as a supporter um, in your local community. And I'm going to use our con context of North Devon to, to give you some examples of that. Um, so we recently uh, welcomed a three generation family into a nearby village. And one of the things that we um, have just loved uh, witnessing in them is their um, joy at seeing Ukrainian flags um, in the area. 
And so my first thing is that um, it would be so amazing if you could literally just display a window uh, in your window or in your garden, a flag or wear on your person um, a badge or a sunflower in the colours of Ukraine. Because I think although it's a small thing as an individual, collectively, it's such a, an amazing sort of visual aid of solidarity and support for our Ukrainian arrivals. And you just and it's without words, they can just walk around and see that that level of support so preferably uh, get badges that have sustainable um, materials and um, we've got a local group here who are going to be sewing um, lots for us and delivering them to our village stores so that we can purchase the badges show that we welcome um, Ukrainians here and at the same time give some money that can then go direct to a Ukrainian family when they arrive so number two uh, find a sponsor near you um, who um, is welcoming a family or a person or a couple to their home and offer your support and be specific about what you can offer so we've already heard from Chris before the different categories on that on that wheel so if you're good with education or you've got a background in healthcare or um, knowledge about safeguarding maybe have access to a car and you've got daylight and um, you know you're available during the day then all those things are really helpful and if you could like reach out and find a sponsor and say look I have this gift I have this skill can I offer it to you um, I think that would be really fantastic so near us we've just put together a support group around a family who've arrived um, on behalf of a sponsor who actually lives away they live in London and it's their holiday home. So they don't have many contacts here. So we were able, um, as the local coordinator with our um, with our council and having that remit, we were able to put together a support group. We trained them, we gave them a rotor and, and let them um, go off and start doing their support. And it has been absolutely incredible to the point where the family were interviewed on BBC local radio this morning saying just tearfully how welcomed they've been. And it's been a really incredible thing to see. And just to echo what Chris was saying about there's something really wonderful about doing this support together um, that, that just brings that, that you know, when you deal with challenges, um, actually, they don't, it, it's better together to do that. Um, and also to share in the joys, because there is so much joy um, in this work to be had. Um, and if you're a sponsor, don't feel shy to reach out for support that's the other thing and I think if you look at the numbers that are on this webinar alone it's a visual aid of how many people want to support and and draw alongside you so don't don't be embarrassed to do that um, so do reach out if you're a sponsor um, number three, find out what voluntary initiatives are starting up near you. So um, here in Devon, we've got two big welcome hubs that are setting up in two key big towns that are kind of going to be acting as um, sort of big centres. And then but out from that, there are all sorts of voluntary initiatives. There's a village hall local to me. They're doing tea and coffee every Tuesday morning uh, for locals and Ukrainian arrivals. Um, and so everything that's happening, we're actually plotting it um, on a digital map for our area, Northern Devon, and that will um, show, uh, so our, on our website, we, it can be translated in English or Ukrainian, and that map will sit on there, and that means that anyone who is looking for somewhere nearby to go to for support, we've got free ear tests that have been um, offered, all sorts of things, that will all be on the map, and they can find what's local to them and go and um, enjoy that as a resource. Um, if you're um, wanting to, if you really want to give something to those voluntary initiatives, so find them and then again, offer specific support, say, oh, I'm really good at this or I'm a local. I've lived here for 20 years or for 40 years and, and I can show you around and I can introduce you to Jim at the pub because he knows about that thing that you're interested in. So actually, that would be a really good thing to volunteer your time for. And if you can't volunteer time, you can donate money or baking. So we've got a friend, an 88 year old uh, woman who was thinking, what can I do? And she's ended up baking um, gingerbread people and making Ukrainian colored scarves around their necks and giving them to her local welcome hub. So there's all sorts of things. There's an initiative in South Devon that have been in touch with us called um, Summer House Services. And similar to what you said earlier, Chris, they're welcome shoe boxes full of essentials for people and they're sending them out now across Devon. There's a local um, friend that did a jumble sale and gave all the proceeds to the two new families that have just arrived who were so grateful because they arrived with nothing. 
Mm. If you don't know where to start on that, then you can go to the, your local council and they should be able to help you with what to do. Um, the fourth thing is do go to social media to reach out if you want to find someone who um, is a sponsor and offer yourself. However, if you could at the same time ask them to private message you back, because I think it's it's been a little bit worrying on a safeguarding front in terms of how many social mm. media I'm, you're going to choose Facebook because it's obvious, but lots of social media sites being set up with details um, about the families coming. And just to put it in context, all the refugee schemes that have gone before are very much we don't publicise the names, the ages, the jobs, where they've come from. Maybe sometimes where they've come from in a private conversation, but they don't know the date of the arrival and they definitely don't know the address that the people are coming to. So this scheme feels a little bit scary in how much information is out there. So if you do reach out on social media, just make sure you then take it offline onto WhatsApp or direct messaging. And the last thing that I want to say is that there is lots of frustration and lots of anger out there and we totally get why. It has been a frustrating process. But I just want to ask, as my fifth point, to just really think about the refugee charities that work in this sector right now, and, and not just the charities, just the sector as a whole. And I'm giving a special shout out to my friends and colleagues at Reset here. You know, it's been four weeks now. There's been very little sleep, very little funding mm. or no funding. And we're all working um, and doing our absolute best because we are so passionate um, about welcoming refugees. So I think just if you're getting in touch with anyone in the refugee sector right now over any question at all, just put a PS at the end of your email that's just like, thank you or keep going <laughs> or you can do this or some positive message, um, because I think that will go a long way at the moment. And that's thanks, that's really Yvonne. Good. Can I give a quick plug for tomorrow? Because we're Please, on yeah. Thursday. On Thursday, we're doing a Devon, a Northern Devon webinar with our MP, our council leaders, um, and us. And we're talking about the plan for Northern Devon. So I'm just doing a quick plug here, Chris, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah. We'll be advertising it um, in the next 24 hours to try and get sign ups. Brilliant. We'll shout that out as well. Um, a lot of people asking for you know more information. And, and that link that we put up, we'll send everyone an email with the links that you've seen on the screen and ways that you, you can follow that up. Uh, it, these uh, these yellow and blue little flowers that uh, my wife, sister and daughter have all been making, uh, we, we did them as a fundraiser in our little church after a Sunday service. Someone paid £70 for one of these. It's not because that's, that's what wow. it's worth. It's because people want to get behind this project and offer that welcome and every little bit helps. So... Thank you, Susanna, for what you're doing. And you've given us a great picture of what we can do in, in our different places. As you say, it'll be different in different contexts, but you've given us a really helpful model. So thanks for that. Wonderful. Stick around. We're going to have a chance to pick up some of the questions that have come up uh, as we go. We've just got a couple more presentations for you, just trying to give you that whole view that we saw at the beginning, the different aspects of support that we need to think about in advance of people arriving or if they've already arrived, making sure that that support is there. I want to talk a bit about schools now. And it's been a pleasure uh, to work with RE UK, Refugee Education UK, again, a charity that's been working in this space for a very long time. And uh, it was great to be able to invite Hannah to come and join us. Uh, Hannah Elwin, hey, nice to see you. And um, Hannah, thanks for joining us. I know it's it's busy time of the year. It's school holidays and uh, you've got a lot on. Uh, I know you're expecting a little one, another little one yourself. So thank, thanks for making time. Um, Hannah, help, help us understand what what why is education so important uh, to refugee families getting settled here? Yeah. Um, well, we are really passionate about education at our UK. Um, actually, firstly, just because we found um, over the years and working with now thousands of young refugees and asylum seekers that education is a place of, of hope. Um, for a refugee or an asylum seeker, um, you know, a lot of their lives will be um, kind of focused on the past, partly because it has to be by nature of um, the different processes they'll be going through. And of course, just their personal lives and what they've just experienced. But when a young person or a child is in school or college, it's the one place where we're saying, hey, what do you want to do in the future? Who do you want to become? Uh, what do you care about? Um, it's relationships, friendships, play 
way and it's forward looking. So education is really, really important and research really backs us up in terms of um, the well-being of young refugees and asylum seekers that when they're in school, um, they tend to um, be able to heal better, rebuild, settle in. Um, so if you have primary school age children, it's a place where they can get to know other kids their age. They can play, they can run around, they can do art, they can do sports. Um, school is an amazing thing. Um, and then of course, for young people as well, it's a place for peer support, a place to dream and a place to think about the, their own future. Um, and not only that, but um, also for parents, for the whole family, it creates a routine. It creates a new structure to their days and their weeks, which I mean, I've not been through the refugee experience, but you can only imagine the upheaval, the, the chaos internally that they must be going through when they first arrive. So school and college is really, really important for these children, young people, families. Um, and also you kind of mentioned at the beginning, Krish, just that school, um, in particular, primary schools really open up a whole world of support um, and sec secondary and colleges as well. Um, I know I'm a primary school, I have a primary school age child and um, I'm receiving all the time information from my local school about um, you know, do families, uh, we support families in our school who might need food over the holidays. Uh, we have access to our local um, council's various parenting courses, well-being courses, all kinds of services have been opened up to my family since my daughter started school. Um, and not only that, but um, it's another way for us to help um, open up the community to these new families. So um, again, just from really personal experience, I live, uh, the local area I live in, before my daughter started school, I didn't really know that many people uh, when I walked along the streets, went to the supermarket, whatever it was. And now most days I bump into someone I know um, just from chatting at a school mm. gate or just by face and you know, you wave to them. And that's um, again, one of these small, but actually very powerful things that yeah. will make a massive difference to these family lives. So um, yeah, absolutely. School, college, uh, education is really, really important. And, and I, I thought maybe that there might be a time lag that people would want some time to settle in and, you know, worry about school a little bit later. For, but from my experience, refugee families seem to want to get into school as quickly as possible. And it sounds like you're saying that should be a priority. We should make that happen as fast as they want it to. Absolutely. And that's something we see over and over and over just anecdotally from I've worked with, um, like I said, hundreds of young people now. and. Um, it's, I mean, almost never happens that someone says, oh, I don't really want to go to school. Um, when they arrive, it's the first thing they want to do. And this is, I've worked with young people who've actually in their uh, country of origin have never been to, never had that opportunity and they are so excited or they'd been in school and that is where they want to be here. And yeah. families will want, always want their children to be we all want our children to be in education to be somewhere safe yeah. to yeah. be somewhere where they're looked after where their structure um where they're going to learn where they're going to make friends um so yeah absolutely i think it should be one of the key priorities as we see families arrive great so imagine you've got someone here they're not going to host a family in their house but they think i'll, I'll take on the education piece you know that would be my part of the puzzle that i bring to my community what are some of the top priorities that a community of support might be trying to find uh, when it comes to education? Well, actually, I saw in the in some of the comments in the chat, um, some people are doing some amazing things that we can learn from um, and that I would like definitely say um, are a great starting point. So someone was saying they know that um, they're hoping to have some families arrive. So they've started contacting schools already, their local schools, find out where are their places, um, just give them a heads up that this is what the community's expecting, the, the number of families they're expecting to receive. Um, and absolutely, I think just going to schools, um, finding out, yeah, where there are places in advance so that you know. Um, and then once families arrive, like, I just think giving them a little tour of a local primary school or secondary mm -hmm. school is an amazing thing. So would the school be open to, I mean, they will be, um, giving families a little tour just to show them this is what a school here in the UK will look like. Um, we on our UK are 
um, websites linked there. We have some um, welcome packs um, that we produced for Afghan new arrivals um, very recently, but we're translating it right now into Ukrainian. And that will give pictures of like, this is what your classroom will look like. We've also have links to some YouTube videos we've made with primary school, secondary schools to say, this is what our classrooms will look like, um, that kind of thing. And I love uh, what was just said um, about kind of thinking about flags and kind of symbols or like your pin Krish and symbols that show you're welcome here. So um, one thing that we've um, seen primary schools and secondary schools do is, you know, they'll often have like welcome on the at the school reception, my local school does, and just making sure, hey, can we put, make sure Ukrainians there or put up some flags um, if we know we're going to have new families. Um, so little things like that can make a big difference in advance of arrival and once they've arrived and before they start school. Um, and Thank just you. to mention, we've heard that, um, we found out recently that FE courses will be free for UK Ukrainian ar new arrivals. So usually you'd have to be resident in the UK for three years, but um, that won't be the case um, for Ukrainian arrivals, which is really encouraging. And we're doing a lot of work with many others on university as well. Currently, that's um, and not the case, but um, in terms of home um, fees no. and support, student support for Ukrainian arrivals. But it, um, it kind of if you do have university students arriving in your community, really keep plugged in and contact us if you'd like more information as things develop. Thank you, Hannah. And great that we've got the REUK resources. Again, we'll email the link out to that to everyone that's registered for today. Stick around. I'm sure people have questions. Uh, I've posted something in the chat, uh, trying to do two things at once. Hope I did that right. Um, we've created some banners that have been used around the country. Actually, um, Callum, if you can find a picture for me, um, I had one on one of my slides. Um, it's a little banner. It says Ukrainians welcome here in English and in Ukrainian and uh, we used it at our little launch event and nice in the yellow and blue uh, that's available uh, if you buy it through the link we've given um, I think we get a little donation at Sanctuary Foundation as well uh, but again when we did this for Afghan refugees the lovely thing was some churches and community centres put it up and uh, the Afghans came and took selfies of themselves in front of these banners welcoming them in their own language and again it just helped them know that the country was here for them that they wanted to wrap around and offer them uh, support so um, have a look at that link uh, other banners are available but there's one that we've prepared for you in advance now lots and lots of questions came up about dbs checks and so it's great we've got someone here who can help us uh, with some of those questions uh matthew from 318 uh thank you for joining us matthew cody uh, oh, just help us understand um about uh, maybe you've been following in the chat some of the questions that have been coming up about DBS checks. Uh, can you help us understand what's the status? We heard from Sally that the local authority will pay for them if you're a host, but what about the rest of people? Give, give us a bit of an overview, Matthew. Great, thanks, Krish. Um, so yeah, as Sally very kindly confirmed for us earlier, if, if you're um, part of the uh, Homes for Ukraine scheme, it is the local authority that will um, Fun uh, process your DBS check, so you do not need to source that yourselves. Um, it's more for um, community groups, um, churches, or, or other charities that are going to be providing um, wraparound support. So maybe they're setting up groups um, for refugees where they will need to consider um, getting their own DBS checks. And a, a big part of that is is being prepared early. That's that's one of the recommendations we would have um, is to plan well and be ready early. Now we've produced at thirty one eight a resource to help organizations with getting prepared um, now this is something that's available freely to anyone you don't need to be members with us um, it's a safeguarding blog that we've um, produced and it's got um, seven top tips for getting ready getting prepared um, and got links to lots of useful um, resources externally as well um, sanctuary foundation being one of those resources that signposted there as well um, from a DBS point of view, um, on the subject of being prepared, um, one of the things you do need to look at is what the responsibilities and uh, duties of volunteers are going to be, because that's um, key in deciding and working out whether or not you can request a DBS check or not, because you'll need to know what the person is doing um, in order to determine what type of DBS check they may need. Now, in, in terms of DBS checking, um, one of the slightly um, areas that can cause confusion, if you like, is um, the DBS themselves would not necessarily automatically consider someone who's a refugee to be a vulnerable adult. 
Um, when the DBS talk about people who are vulnerable, they are specifically looking at people who are needing additional support due to age, illness or disability. Um, so it's not to say that some refugees are, are not going to be vulnerable and fit that DBS definition, um, but they wouldn't uh, apply a blanket rule that all refugees, if you're working with them, you need an enhanced check. Um, so you need to look at the responsibilities very carefully. If you've got people that are taking refugees to medical appointments, then you're you're supporting them due to some sort of illness that they're suffering. So it depends on um, how you are helping refugees. Um, if you're working with children, um, so setting up maybe uh, toddler groups or childcare groups to give mums a break, um, then obviously enhanced checks will be applicable there um, because they're working with children. Um, but if let's say you've got uh, a role that doesn't qualify for an enhanced check for one reason or another, um, but you still want to incorporate a DBS check as part of your recruitment procedures, um, you can look at getting something called a basic disclosure. So there's no criteria you have to meet to ask for that. Um, anyone can have a basic disclosure. Um, it, it's a case of you would set your own threshold for whether you would like people um, to have them or not. Um, I mean, Matthew, can I just ask you a quick question there? Sure. Um, so let, let's say we're just an informal group. We're local residents in our little town. We're not a registered charity. We're just people trying to do our best to support refugees. Um, and we recognise, you know, we might want to help with, as you say, hospital visits or picking people up from the airport or whatever. Mm. Um, and we think, oh, we... Thanks, Krish. That 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 leads really nicely on to what I wanted to talk about. So, um, yeah, if, if you've never had to um, access DBS checks before and don't know where to start, um, well, if you are a really small organisation, um, got less than 100 people that would need a DBS check, then you're unable to access those directly from the DBS. You would have to access a umbrella body. Um, so there's a whole network of umbrella bodies out there. Um, you can find details of those on the DBS website. Um, the organisation I'm here from, 318, we are we are a safeguarding charity, um, but we are a DBS umbrella body as well. Um, so if you did need help with obtaining DBS checks, um, advice around who may or may not need them, um, then that is something that we can help with um, and guide you through that process. But there are lots of other uh, organisations out there as well that can help. And if you are already um, with a DBS umbrella body, um, get in touch with them because they will be the people to advise you on exactly and help you decide um, what level of DBS check um, people will need for working refugees. Because it's it's really going to, it's not a one size fits all approach. It's really going to depend on how your uh, group is is serving those people. Thank you, Matthew. And you're very gracious, uh, you know, promoting other organisations as well. I put your link, 31A, into the chat. Uh, so if people do want to think, hold on, you know, we're not a registered charity. We just want to know where to go. Uh, I've, I've linked you to 31A and we're grateful for your support over the years. Um, was, was there anything else you wanted to say? I'm just going to um, come to our final guest and then throw it open for some questions. I think I've covered the, the main talking points I wanted there, but I'll, I'll hang on for questions in case there's anything that uh, that crops up. Amazing. Thank you so much, Matthew. Now, in a moment, uh, and I'm speaking uh, both to my speakers and to my guests, because there's been so many comments in the chat. Uh, I just wonder if each of my speakers wants to have a little scan down the YouTube comments and pick up a couple of questions that have been raised that kind of relate to their area. Uh, but before we do that, I want to introduce you to one very special guest who's joining us all the way. I think he's in Boston, but he travels a, a lot around the world, um, is Ed Shapiro. And Ed Shapiro is, is a global expert in refugee resettlement he has a passion for this and Ed that that wasn't your kind of original career choice tell, tell us what you were doing and how you became switched on to refugees um hello Chris hello everyone thank you um well that's that's a a long story but I, I came from a 27 year career in the investment business and about uh, six or seven years ago, like many others around the world, I was watching what was happening uh, in Syria, uh, watching what was happening in the central Mediterranean and felt compelled to go bear witness, tra travel to, to, to Lesbos, to Jordan. And I came back with sort of this um, uh, plan or idea uh, in, in my own country in the US, this was in uh, early 2016, to find ways to unlock the public support. I heard from so many friends and family who were also watching on the news, much like we're seeing now, uh, of the horrific situation, literally a quarter of the country of Syria fleeing in, in a relatively short period of time for their lives and, and wondering what you could do to help. There, there are plenty of organizations doing work, and continue to 12 years later, 
but the idea of being able to play some local role in your own communities with these families became sort of a, a, a small project for me, which ended up being life-changing. My own family has been incredibly involved with the Syrian family that we welcomed just over five years ago. They're, they're on the cusp of being eligible for, for citizenship here. And it really, for me, was life-changing in that I believed, regardless of your politics, regardless of the timing and your geography, there was a significant number of people, if given the opportunity, if supported, if trained, if, uh, if recruited, would want to do what my family and my, my community did. And uh, I spent the next four years very active working with you and others in, in programs in, in, in the UK, particularly in Canada. Many of you know have, um, have led the world in terms of their openness and, and their embracing of public support of community sponsorship. Um, and in the last 15 months or so, um, under the new administration in the US, we've turned our attention back to being able to do that here, to being able to create new programs based on all of our experience the, the situation in Afghanistan this summer um, ultimately resulted in 76,000 Afghans coming to the United States and needing welcome, needing communities. I think there are 150 cities across the United States now that have welcomed these 76,000 Afghans mm -hmm. with more arriving every day. And now we're on the cusp of doing something very similar for, for Ukraine. So it's been, a, it's been a passion. I made a decision five and a half years ago that this is what I wanted to do with my life and, and full-time and, and it's global. It's where are their opportunities, where is their public support and governments um, that we can work with to make this successful. Well, we're really grateful for your support, Ed. And I, I guess to our, our viewers, there, there's a bit of a health warning here um, in that welcoming a refugee family into your home might not just change your life for the next couple of months. It could change your life forever. Uh, a friend of mine said to me, you know, I, I, I was making money, but I didn't feel like I was making a difference. And you can definitely make a difference in the lives of refugee families. Um, and, and some of you might be here with kind of two hats on. You're a kind of local community volunteer, which is brilliant, but you also have a business background and you know business has an important role to play in making refugees feel welcome uh, we're seeing that across the nation with offers of employment uh, or support to workers that are also um, stepping up to be hosts um, and some really creative things have been happening I know Ed you're involved in the airline industry and they've been doing an incredible job offering free flights to get people out uh, another one of our friends is on the board of Airbnb and again they as an organization have done incredible things I, I wonder Ed, just to give us some ideas from different places around the world where you've seen communities do some really great stuff. You've got people from villages and cities and towns across the UK. What are some great ideas you've seen that we might be able to learn from, from other places? Yeah, I, I, honestly, Chris, you know, what the UK is doing in a, in a number of ways is, is leading the world. Um, I was there uh, with you last week, meeting with a number of partners and philanthropic partners, government officials. Um, the world is figuring this out. But unlike some other um, recent events, Ukraine has captured the world's attention and, and countries that have a long history, like, like Canada and at various times the U.S. are, are, are opening their doors. Um, Eastern Europe, uh, the neighboring countries obviously have received these four and a half million, welcomed them into their homes in massive, unprecedented ways. Even, even South America, Japan, part of Asia have, have been following this lead and, and really governments responding to their citizens, responding to their outcry, we need to do something. And it's incredibly impressive to me to watch governments and in particular the UK, which is, you know, I almost was, when I started hearing a few weeks ago about this evolving homes for Ukraine scheme, the idea that there would be an unlimited number um, permitted in, get given visas. I know it's not happening as fast as, as many of us would like, but I'm, I'm confident it is happening and it is going to accelerate. Um, and it has government support and, and funding uh, and, and um, authorization for work and other critical issues and access to services. So I think there isn't a one size fits all. For example, the you know, EU opening their borders and not requiring um, uh, visas, um, the US, Canada, the UK um, have legal restrictions. And so there, there is a visa process, but, but it is happening in very large numbers. Um, how many want to come? Do they want, do they have family in places like um, Germany or France or Spain or the UK or the US or Canada? That will be an important consideration. Obviously we're in a unique situation where for the most part families are being separated 
here, right? The, the, yeah. the men yeah. are staying behind. And so whether a family would otherwise want to go to the UK or Canada or the US, they may not be able to, or they may not be willing to today, um, but that may change. It's probably different than it was three or four weeks ago, and it will be different still, depending on what happens. We all hope they can go back. We all hope they have the opportunity to rebuild their lives and rejoin their family, but we obviously don't know that. So I think yeah. what you've seen consistently around the world are schemes that are broadly open, uh, uncapped, certainly in the case of, of the UK, um, but also meant to be temporary. Temporary, not not weeks or months, it could be years. Um, and we don't know what that could turn into, but I think that is a critical common issue. Mm -hmm. I think a significant difference that we're seeing emerge is, is whether there are quotas, right? The EU and the UK and Canada have said, basically there are no limits on this program. Yeah. The US, yeah. at least initially, President Biden announced 100,000. We'll, we'll see where that goes. We'll see how many people ultimately take that offer up. But I think there are some key characteristics around the fact that it's temporary, the fact that there's broad access, and really critically from my perspective, you, you touched on it, is refugee resettlement, in my opinion, is a win-win. Citizens want to help. We're, we're all seeing the images on the news, but we're also seeing that if properly supported, these individuals are going to become productive members of the society. We, we yeah. have an aging yeah. population in most Western worlds. We have low, relatively low birth rates, and these people are coming and being supported and embraced. And depending on how this um, progresses, we, we need to make them uh, feel like they can contribute. No one wants to be um, long-term on the handouts. They want to help. They want to get jobs and they want to participate right. and they want their kids to be educated. So I think you're seeing that largely across the world. Amazing. So encouraging. Sometimes when we look at the UK, we can see all the problems. But thanks for giving us the panoramic view that there's some incredible things happening. As you say, an uncapped sponsorship program it is pretty unheard of in, in the kind of West at the moment. So um, amazing to see that happening. And as thank well you as government, go, the government funding, right? The, 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 yeah. the scheme that the Home for Ukraine has direct support to sponsors and communities. That mm -hmm. is a very significant, I know, um, without divulging uh, details, the U.S. is looking at that and seeing U.K.'s leadership and, and a recognition that th this is a burden on communities, schools, hospitals, um, healthcare, police are going to have costs in the short term. And so the U.K. has recognized this and is providing direct support to the hosts as well as the local communities. And I think that's really important. Fantastic. Thank you, Ed. Stick around in case people have questions, but thanks for giving us that global perspective. Let's bring as many of my guests uh, as we can back onto the screen and uh, we'll pick up some of the questions uh, that you've seen in the chat. Um, one I saw earlier was about training. Uh, just to let you know that um, Sanctuary Foundation has a training boot camp uh, that we're launching in the next 10 days. We've written it. Uh, many of our guests tonight, uh, this afternoon, have been uh, contributors to it. Uh, that's coming. That's for everybody. That's for people that want to volunteer and support uh, and for hosts and for anyone else that has a touch point with uh, Ukrainian refugees. If you have registered on the Sanctuary Foundation website, we'll let you know uh, about it very soon. Uh, but that is coming. Now, um, Matt, I just wondered, were there any other DBS questions that you saw come up? Otherwise, we'll hear from Susanna next. Uh, there was one that came up quite a few times in several different variations. Um, so it was to do with uh, using DBS checks portably, uh, essentially. So um, DBS checks are not automatically portable. Um, the only time they would be is if someone joins something called the DBS update service. Um, and even then, there are limitations. Um, you're only allowed to use the update service portably um, where you already have the exact uh, level of DBS check that you need for the role you wish to do from somewhere else. So quite often, um, people won't have the appropriate type of DBS check already. Um, the update service is very useful for people like doctors, nurses, or uh, like supply teachers, because they do the same thing at lots of different places. But people that are volunteering um, somewhere doing one thing, uh, and maybe got paid employment elsewhere, it, it doesn't always work very well for. So sometimes it, it may involve doing a new DBS check for someone, even if they already hold one from elsewhere. Yeah, it sounds like if in, if in doubt, get a new one. It, it's only a few quid, isn't it? 13 pounds, I, I saw that in the chat, is that right? Um, if it's a basic disclosure, it is £18 that the DBS would charge, and then an umbrella body will likely charge you an admin fee on top. 
Um, sure. If they're an enhanced, if it's an enhanced check they're having, um, and they're a volunteer, the DBS won't charge anything. It will just be the admin fee that the umbrella body uh, charges. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Thank you, uh, Susanna. Anything you picked up in the chat you think you'd like to answer? There's nothing really specific for me, actually. I felt it was more about DBS checks, training and um, baby basics um, questions, but I'm really happy to, to take any, but I don't think there was anything screaming at me. <laughs> That's nice. You're off the hook. That's a cop out, uh, let's isn't hear it? From, <laughs> let's hear from Kat at Baby Basics. What were you noticing that people were asking? Um, I think the biggest people, people were questioning it was um, the need for new car seats, and I totally get it. They are an expensive thing, which is why we're trying to provide them. Um, but it is really important because of your car insurance that you do use new car seats. However, if you already have children of your own in your family and you have car seats and you can use those car seats for your Ukrainian family, that's absolutely fine because you know they are safe and your car insurance is fine. Um, but if you don't and you need one, please get new. Thank you, Kat. Really helpful. I saw a question about phase two, and I've been talking with the government about this. Uh, so phase phase one covered two different routes of getting uh, refugees from Ukraine into the UK. So one was the family route. Um, and uh, there's some big questions about the level of checking and support that's available there. That, that That's something we continually speak to the government about. The second is the Homes for Ukraine project, which you should know a lot about by now, and it's evolving, and that's the biggest project in town. But phase two is as yet undisclosed and unclear what that's going to mean. Uh, and that's why we've had this seminar today to say, while we're waiting for phase two to kick off, um, let's wrap around the existing host. That seems to be the best way that the community can get involved. As a church or a business, at the moment, you can't be a sponsor. That may come down the line, but what you can do is support existing sponsors and provide support to them. So that's what we're suggesting you do in the meantime. If phase two does become clearer, we'll run another one of these and we'll talk you through it. But we don't need to wait in order to be helpful as a community. We can wrap around. Um, Hannah, Sophia or Sally, anything that you noticed in the chat that you'd like to pick up on? Um, yeah, Hannah, go for it. Yeah, I there was a really specific question that I thought I would, I don't have like a perfect answer to, but I'll address it. Um, yeah, this one here, can you suggest um, how to find support and education for 17 year olds who should be finishing school this year? Um, so having, I used to work on access to higher education and I know that um, it, it just depends on how his qualifications in the Ukraine translate into the UK, which I'm unsure of um, just yet. Um, so you'll need to probably, probably he'll just need to talk to the school. Um, and it kind of depends on what his education was in the Ukraine specifically, like what qualifications he did. And just to mention that if he wanted to apply for university, um, if he, all his education was in Ukrainian, he'll need um, probably what's called an IELTS qualification, um, which is an English exam that you have to do to get into higher education. Um, but it may be that he'll have to do A-levels here. Um, sorry, I don't have the perfect answer. It, it kind of depends on the specifics. But I would say definitely um, get in touch with the local secondary school where you think he'll be going. And they'll be able to really help you. Um, and I hope it goes really well for him. Brilliant. We, we've got a few more minutes. Um, there's something I want to tell you about that's coming down the line in terms of community transplant. That's the model I'm, I'm uh, exploring. Uh, but uh, Ed or Sally or Sophia, anything else you wanted to, to pick up on that you saw in the chat? Just had a quick point. Um, if I could just uh, mention the AUGB website again, please. Um, I think it's just going to come up as a link. But also I did notice someone mentioned Easter. Um, Ukrainians have a different Easter to um, the English Easter and we are and I think it's a really nice time to if you do have refugees with families already in your homes I think it's a really nice time to enhance and embrace that because it is a very different tradition that we do do have the Ukrainian Easter and I think it'd be a lovely time because they'll be missing family they'll be missing friends they're missing their homes um, if you don't have a Ukrainian community on your doorstep just google what we do there's baskets blessing we do pisanke which are painted eggs and it's just a lovely time and it just makes them feel a little bit more less homesick and home from home it's, it's a week after our easter it's 26 
I believe. Excellent. That's a good idea. We should we should get some local groups running those kind of events. Thank you for putting that up there. Sally, anything from you or Ed? Nothing specific from me except to note Paul's comment that he um, managed to get his checks done before the visa was approved. And I'm going to work out how that happened because that would be really good news <laughs> if that data was flowing more, more quickly than I thought. Um, the only other thing I just wanted to ask was if you could capture the questions that we haven't been able mm. to answer in here, it would be really useful, I think, if we supplemented the work that governments are doing to develop their FAQs and had a shared set that we um, shared between us as well because there are just so many questions coming through all the time and we'd be keen to um, include them on our website as I'm sure others would be. Thanks. That's right. Good. Uh, just a couple of notices then. So um, this chat will remain there alongside this video. Um, and if you do want to share it with other people, you can. Uh, I'll email everybody that registered as well to make sure they've got it. Uh, so you'll be able to see that. And, and again, um, a lot of you are asking questions about we just want help connecting with other people in our area. I wish we were a big enough organisation to help you with that. That's a project we can work on down the line. But in the meantime, the things I would suggest you do is get on your local community Facebook groups and just find out who's already out there doing stuff. Talk to your local authority. You might be able to reach out to your strategic migration partnership as well. That's another group that you can Google um, and they might have some um, opportunities for you to connect with others. And if no one is doing anything, start something. And uh, if you come across people after you've got started, just find a way to combine. Sometimes it takes one of us to take the lead, do our best. And if we're treading on other people's toes, we can apologise later. That seems to be the approach I need to take sometimes. So wonderful. The other group that you might want to connect with is Cities of Sanctuary. Uh, sometimes your city might have already decided to become uh, a kind of place where refugees are welcome. And they might have some other groups going. Uh, we are not Cities of Sanctuary, but we share a common love of the word sanctuary so uh, we're, we're kind of keen to cheer on their work now the last thing to say to you um apart from thank you for joining us thank you to all my uh, guests please express your appreciation in the chat give them a cheer or a thumbs up or an emoji uh, some of them aren't used to going on to these kind of live events speaking to at least 600 700 people at a time that's beyond the comfort zone of some of my guests so we're really grateful for all of you that did that um, it's just to kind of give you a heads up that we're experimenting with a new form of, of um, I suppose, community sponsorship. Um, we've been thinking about one family coming to another household in the UK, but that's not a natural way of thinking about moving a community. I always say, if you're trying to move a tree, you don't move it leaf by leaf, branch by branch. You move the whole tree and you try to keep the roots together, don't you? So then it's got a, at least a better chance of taking root in a new environment. Uh, and trees are movable. I've seen it happen. Kew Gardens managed it. So um, how do you move a community? It's better if you move them in a group. And we're working on a pilot program right now, and I'd love to tell you more about it when that pilot is done, about moving a group of 20 to 30 refugees that might be an extended family or a larger group uh, that become a family or a or a community in transit, some of them are staying in Poland, in, in big centres there, and then finding some hosts that haven't been matched in a, in a geographical area and seeing if we can move those two together. Um, we think that's going to help us with safeguarding, support, networking, providing all those services. Um, and, and if that's something you're interested in in your community, then when I send you an email later, uh, just let me know. But we're doing a pilot first to see if we can get one over the line, because we think that will particularly protect vulnerable young women who seem to be being preyed on at the moment. If they know that three doors down, uh, there's another family or just 20 minutes walk across town, there's another family that they can connect with. That could be a real game changer for them. So we'll, we'll keep you in the frame. But can I say one last thank you, um, Callum, who has been amazing. You can come on screen if you want to, Callum, but you don't need to. He's been pulling the strings in the background, uh, making sure all of our guests are looked after. Uh, he signed up to help me yesterday and he's turned around this all in one day and he's been absolutely brilliant. So big thank you to Callum and Kerith Church uh, for giving us your support. It's really kind of you. And yeah, you're staying in the background. That's fine. We're, we're grateful for you. Have a fantastic day, everybody, and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to our guests. God bless you. Thanks, everyone. Keep up the good work. Brilliant. Guests, uh, you can stay on for a minute. We're going to be in the green room together, uh, but everyone else, we'll see you soon.